last time we were discussing about HTML, which stands for Hypertext Markup Language. That is primarily the language which is the first language, first markup language, which made it possible to retrieve documents stored in the World Wide Web. Before that, they did not have a clear, clear uh, method and idea of navigating through so many thousands of documents spread all over the web. And uh, the greatest contribution which was made by the first inventor of uh, World Wide Web and uh, the associated documentation uh, whose name is Bernard Lee who is working at CERN in Switzerland, CERN lab which is a, actually a nuclear physics lab in uh, Switzerland. His contribution was to think about this kind of a hypertext uh, that means linking a text to other texts and then associated with it a uh, markup language was essentially proposed by him and it was refined and a consortium called the World Wide Web Consortium called W3 Consortium nowadays standardized HTML. And in fact, today lot of the work which is done on the World Wide Web, all the new standards and new applications which come on the web are all cleared by the World Wide Web Confederation. That is the, the group of people, technical people primarily, who form a group to sift through all ideas which come to them and then ultimately standardize what is to be used by all users of the web. This kind of a standardization is extremely important, particularly when a worldwide set of uh, people are going to be using some facility which is not really owned by them. The machines are all owned by diverse organizations and they are all connected together, interconnected. So, they have to cooperate. In a cooperation, cooperative system or a cooperative world, it is extremely important for all the cooperating entities to follow a common protocol, common standard and otherwise it is just not possible to communicate. It is like saying that communication requires that we all speak a common language. Otherwise, we need interpreters everywhere, see. So, the whole idea of standards is essentially what has spawned the uh, widespread use of the World Wide Web. So, HTML is a standard which has been uh, approved by the World Wide Web Consortium uh, of uh, technical experts and it is actually run on a professional basis. And, um, time to time they do get new proposals, they have sift through the proposal and ac accept some of them and then the standardization group gets together to standardize it. So, HTML is now that way a kind of a, a standard um, which is used by all the users of the World Wide Web. In other words, if you really want to put one of your own documents on the web or to make your own website which is to be accessed by other people, you have to follow the standard, otherwise nobody can access you. So, in other words, you are forced per se to use the HTML as a standard language to uh, specify your entire document which you store in your web page. So, web page design essentially consists of a lot of course, aesthetic issues and what information ought to get in there and so on. But over and above that, it also needs to have certain structure and the structure or a syntax is what is decided by the HTML and that allows your document also to be linked to others and you can also link to other documents, not only other documents, but other images and so on. As you pointed out, there are anchor tags to um, get to other um, other websites and we can use a, a so a CRC command 
to be able to get to uh, images which are stored elsewhere. It may be not necessarily in your web page, it could be in somebody else's uh, web, but you can link to that particular uh, uh, image and get that displayed when uh, you uh, use it for some purpose. Okay. And in fact, most people have web pages which, uh, which conveys a lot of information about themselves and also includes very often, particularly by academics, their publications and many other information about themselves. Okay. And of course, companies find it is extremely important to have web presence as they pointed out last time. So, HTML primarily presents is, is a facilitate, facilitates presentation of the contents of a web page. It does not say anything about the nature of the content. Is it an invoice? Is it a bio data? Is it a purchase order? Is it a book description? You do not really know from the uh, uh, way in which the HTML is designed, it only says what headings are to be put, what is to be the bookmark, what, what link, what other pages to which it gets linked and other kinds of information. And it does not say anything about the uh, what, what it contains, I mean what, what is the meaning of uh, the contents. It also has no means of specifying the type of data. In other words, is it a um, number, is it a character string, is it a structure, data structure, is specifiable. We just need a markup language which is richer and is more descriptive struct of structure of the document and what it represents. In other words, apart from the syntax of representing the pages, you also have to put in some meanings or semantics which others can understand. So, this is a kind of um, um, quest which people got into. In other words, they tried to come up with a new language and um, so the result of that is a, mark, a language called extensible markup language which has become now uh, standardized by the World Wide Web Consortium. And, um, the, in fact, it is based on a very generalized markup language and I um, uh, will say something little bit about it, but I am this purpose in this course is not to get into great detail about uh, market markup languages in general, but there is a generalized markup language whose subset is the extensible markup language called XML. Um, XML uh, the actually you could you could have called it EML, but EML looks somewhat odd, so they just used XML using the second letter of the word extensible. A document has content of course, and uh, it has a structure and it needs to be presented in the for, for ease of reading. Word processors in HTML emphasize presentation of content and I know it means of specifying what the data actually represents, the structure and the content, what, is, what it actually contains, okay, what information does it contain. So, presentation is the emphasis of HTML like paragraphing, bold facing, italics, connecting to other documents and so on. So, XML is a relatively new language, it is not, uh, I do not call it uh, an year old, it has already become about maybe four or five years old now, uh, which is capable of specifying what a document really represents. It has, uh, uh, it is a proper subset of the international standard known as standard generalized markup language or SGML. And uh, SGML was actually proposed by a group of uh, information scientists including librarians and others who specialized in this area. And it is an open standard and it is not proprietary. Um, in, in fact, this uh, standard was very, very general and uh, so general that implementation became a little bit of a, an issue. And so, based on SGML, there are actually derivatives or subsets which effectively use the same spirit of the SGML, but they um, 
they do the job with a simpler language you can, which you can learn quickly and also can be implemented. In other words, you require some method of translating that uh, and that is the implementation issue. And implementation is as important as just proposing something, okay. This again and again occurs in computer science. You know, in the early days, Algol, uh, our algorithmic language was considered an extremely good uh, standard language and uh, promoted by Europeans. And in fact, it was a very good language from the point of view of learning, from the point of view of act actually uh, the syntax of the language. At, at the time it was invented or, or actually proposed, uh, it was uh, considered a very great advance over the existing language uh, at that time for scientific work, namely um, uh, the Fortran and for business data processing, mo mo namely COBA. But of course, Fortran was the primary language for scientific computing and Algol was supposed to kind of replace that. But it so happened that Algol was very nice in terms of the uh, proposed structure of the language and so on, syntax, semantic rules and what not. But when it came to implementation, it became very uh, inefficient, the compilers became very inefficient and uh, Fortran compilers were a lot more efficient. So even though Algol was a good language, everybody, everybody type of uh, agreed to that, but then uh, when it came to use, people used Fortran because it is efficient. And of course, in those days, computer power is at a premium and uh, computer time was not easily available and efficiency was uh, as important or in fact more important than the beauty of the structure of the language, okay. Algol sp uh, spent a lot of time on the beautiful structure of a language. Uh, so in some, some people they say that Algol uh, has the same status as Sanskrit which is uh, chanted by a few high priests but nobody really uses it uh, primarily because it is uh, difficult in some sense. Okay, and for day-to-day -day use, uh, people use something simpler. Okay, and that's what has happened to Algol. Same thing about uh, SGML. SGML is again a uh, superset of all possible markup languages, and of course, subset one of the uh, subsets, a proper subset, you might say, is XML. XML defines the structure of a document. Unlike HTML, it has tags which are user-defined. In HTML, the tags are all static like uh, you know h1 is used for headings and i for italics and so on. And of course there is no markup at all to say what the document really contains. Whereas uh, XML has user defined tags and using those user defined tags you can kind of guess what that uh, document represents if in a, for a human reader, okay. And of course for a computer to interpret you have to define the uh, tags again somewhere and that is what is a method which is used. In other words, XML gives you the freedom to define your own tags but then it also puts, imposes on you a requirement that the tags be explained in some language uh, called, uh, you know, it is called DDT, okay, but I will come, I will come to that. And uh, formatting and presentation are not part of XML unlike HTML, okay. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, this is delegated to another language. Formatting part is delegated to another kind of language called extensible style language because essentially formatting is one of style, you know, boy phase and italics and so on. So there is a extensible, extensible style, style language which accompanies that and says something about the, the uh, how to kind of format that document. But the markup language says something about the content. Linking documents to create hypertext is also not integrated in XML. Okay, XML. To, so to that extent, it is not as uh, simple to uh, use for multi-purpose. Um, and much more powerful linking is enabled by separating it in a companion language called extensible link language. In other words, it divides the concerns which are addressed by HTML into many parts. One is to look at the style the other is to look up the links and uh, the important part namely the content is what XML effectively uh, uh, emphasizes. Like for instance, 
a purchase order is represented using XML. I am not, this course I cannot talk about uh, the entire syntax of XML and uh, describe XML in great detail. Actually books have been written on XML and uh, there are courses which talk to you uh, and which, which deal with XML at great length. But from the point of view of an information systems analyst and designer, uh, the reason I am talking about XML is that when you go to web based uh, um, design, particularly for e-commerce and so on, you must have some understanding of the way in which the content is presented and the meaning of the content is presented. And that is the reason I have given, given you a flavor of what XML is without getting into great depth, depth about XML. Okay? And so, in XML, a purchase order, you know, in this case, the tag which is defined is a purchase order, purchase order that itself is a, is a tag. And uh, the, um, so from the actual, you know, tag, one can guess that the document which follows is a purchase order. So, you can have a order number, uh, date of the order, purchaser's name and purchaser's address. As you can see, just like in H HTML, there is a beginning tag, like in this case, order number is beginning tag and uh, order, uh, order number has got an N with a slash in front of the order number. So, the whatever is contained between these two tags is the actual content of the order number. Okay? And the date of the order, again it, it gives a date. So, from the tag, you can essentially guess what the content is. And so, these are all user defined tags and um, name and slash name. So, you can you know what ABC traders are and their address. Okay. Similarly, um, item, uh, suppose in this purchase order, there is a, an item to be put. You have an item, item name, uh, item definition contains item name which is uh, C programming, item code. In this case, item code is ISBN number of the book and uh, quantity in stock you might say. The purchase order has, it has to mention the quantity. So, 50 is to be ordered and the supplier's name is given as a supplier's name. You can also give supplier's address and so on. Okay. In other words, the entire um, purchase order document can be put in the XML format. Observe the tax, uh, tax used have a syntax similar to HTML. Tags are however meaningful to a human reader. And uh, XML clear, definitely clearly brings out the structure of an invoice. What it, the invoice consists, uh, what all, what the, what all the purchase order con con contains and that is brought out. Okay. However, to interpret such a document and process it by a computer, a companion document called document type definition is needed, that is DTD. Document type definition has its own syntax and uh, we give a DTD for this XML document. That is purchase order, you know, these, these are all, they, they look gibberish to you, but uh, just like any language, it has got some uh, type of, um, you know, it, it, it has a structure, it essentially says uh, uh, the elements of purchase order, order number, date and so on and date can contains really year, month and day, it is actually a structure. And uh, year is a, is a day, a numeric data, month is a numeric data, day is a numeric data. So, there are uh, uh, many parts of it which uh, describe whether it is a numeric data or alphanumeric data and so on. So, DTD specifies all that. Okay. And uh, name is a, is a character data and so on. So, there are uh, actually in this case, see there are these, these things are all defined in the language and as I said, if books have been written, you have to learn. Like any, learning any language, you have to learn all the syntax to be able to write your own, um, uh, your own DTD, okay, and your own XML document, okay. So, the same, I mean, I, I continue on. So, every, every, everything which occurs in that particular uh, XML document, every tag has to be defined in terms of what item for instance <coughs> consists of three parts, item name, item code, 
quantity and the item name and item code are character data and uh, and supplier name also is is got a name as a character data and things of that type okay <coughs> E statement DT declares the elements of XML program. Uh, entry plus states the purchase order is the top level element with one or more entry following it. Two statements introduced at the start of XML definition which specify the version of XML and file name of DT specification. That is, DT specification itself must have a file name. So, that is all, all, all specified. So, Assuming DTD is a fi file purchase order DTD, there is a purchase order dot DTD has, the, has an entire description which I put down. It says XML version so and so, doc type purchase, purchase, purchase orders, system purchase orders, there is in this, this store, it is stored in a file named purchase order dot DTD. Tags used in XML definition are then specified in that DTD. So, in other words, XML is not a standalone, XML is there. Along with it, you got DTD, style language, and link language. All that together is actually a packet, which is lot more general than a single language called like single uh, HTML, uh, and which is obviously much more complex, but much more powerful from the point of view of use. Okay, it's, it's got it, it has semantics it can be processed and so on. That is HTML is only formatting. Uh, so, the string of characters, very various, various elements, P data is string of characters, uh, date specifies a tag, date is a higher level tag which consists of three tags and uh, uh, year declares year as a string of characters, the rest of the DT is similar. Okay. XML's main use in creating documents in the World Wide Web, which can be retrieved by browsers on client computers and then interpreted. User defined tag gives several advantages. You see, there is a, you can send or push uh, information to the user who can interpret it using the DTD. Uh, time bearing data can be specified by users. For, in, for instance, the uh, in a push technology, in other words, if you are a stock broker and you want to get periodically data on the stock market situation, then every hour or every half an hour dep dep de depending upon what you uh, specify, uh, there will be a little demand will wake up and send out that information from that, from that website into years and then you can interpret it with, uh, with the standard XML interpreter which is sitting in your machine. Okay. And uh, so, many things which are time varying like stock prices, we want, we are interested in uh, getting periodically cricket scores something like that, that also can nowadays it is there in somewhere in the web and it can push to you that information one, once in, once in uh, whatever interval you specify. So, for online banking, uh, uh, stand, standard XML, you know, for banking, of course, the tags are all very specific, you know, uh, uh, because things like uh, the uh, withdraw or deposit or uh, wire check and or, 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 you know, the transfer some amount and so on, they are all part of the uh, uh, standard called financial exchange initiative and is used to exchange information such as bank statements. And um, similarly, software and data updates are all essentially pushed through, through an XML document. XML is adaptable to many natural languages such as uh, Canada, Uni, and the Unicode standard is used. In other words, it is not language specific. XML is not specific only to English. You can use uh, other language tags. As far as the machine is concerned, the, those tags will be interpreted as a Unicode or set of bits and it does not know any difference between whether it is Canada or Tamil or, or English or whatever. It only understands the bit string language okay? and that is what the whole thing is about. That is the whole advantage is that it is somewhat language independent. So, you can have an XML document in Chinese or in Hindi or whatever okay? and uh, that is the beauty of this uh, methodology. Provided of course, everybody uses the same kind of a 
coding method and XMLS standard is a Unicode. As I say, pointed out earlier, Unicode is a 16 bit code which is capable of representing any language in the world today. Okay. And um, also other subsets are of SGML similar to XML have been used in other areas for scientific pub publications, uh, markup languages are used. For there is something called chemistry markup language because chemistry and, and mathematics and physics and so on have their own jargon and have their own uh, interesting requirements. Like uh, mathematics will require to represent sets, uh, vectors, matrices and uh, differential equations and stuff like that. And chemistry will have to have to uh, no, represent uh, organic molecules of all, all shapes and sizes and uh, chemical formula and so on. For that, there is chemistry markup languages there. So, uh, in other words, markup language idea is a very powerful ma idea and that is useful, useful in many areas of uh, human activity and you can actually specialize it. And of course, things like chemistry markup, mathematical markup and so on have been standardized by appropriate user groups. So, there is a chemistry group which has sat together and said what is an appropriate markup language to exchange documents or papers in chemistry, similarly mathematics. Uh, because you know if you look at a standard word processor, mathematicians do not like it very much because mathematicians in mathematics you have subscripts, superscripts, uh, sometimes uh, double superscripts and double subscripts and all types of uh, parentheses and uh, symbols. Uh, that like there exists and uh, belongs to and so on. So, they require something which is uh, uh, appropriate for their shorthand which they use, mathematicians use. And that is what is essentially done in the mathematical market language with appropriate group. These are all becoming important because regardless of whether you are a chemist or a mathematician or a physicist or an economist, today everybody is interconnected on the web and there is a large group of cooperating scientists or cooperating individuals and so one would like to communicate easily between groups and that requires standardization. That is what they have done. Okay. So, I have given you a flavor of the World Wide Web and the way in which documents are stored in the World Wide Web and the documents are processed and the need for market languages and uh, that is essentially very quick bird's eye view or uh, two lectures and the whole thing. It does not really do justice to the subject, uh, uh, but on the other hand, it is enough for us to kind of understand the implications of the electronic commerce and how these are all useful in electronic commerce, because we are more interested later on in this course in electronic commerce, because system, anal system analysis and design today is not restricted to a single computer because restricting to simple single computer is extremely constraining. Today no computer is isolated, every computer is connected to every other computer. So, organizations also work with lands in their own organizations. So, many of the uh, modifications that are taking place the design of information systems have to keep in mind this new fact, namely the interconnection and communication between computers. And you also have to be concerned about the fact that um, you once you have interconnected machines of not only a single organization, but multiple or cooperative organizations, you have to have proper standards of communication and proper protocols and so on. And um, there is also an emerging, emerging technology called web services. There are many of the software services are offered by companies on the World Wide Web available to you. Like they are pro providing things like accounting packages available as a web service. So, you can get on to that web to their accounting package and pay by use. So, there is a lot of transformation which is really taking place in the area of, uh, of uh, systems for organizations. The way in which computers are being used by organizations 
is undergoing a shift and we will see probably in the next 5 years a new emergence of a new paradigm or new method of actually using computers and appropriately new methods of designing systems for this changed world. So, I think you should be aware of these things because in your working life which will be will extend probably to hopefully 30 years or so, there is going to be a lot of technological changes and you got to be continuously update, updated and keep yourself up to date and that requires you to kind of at least have an appreciation at this stage of where these uh, networks and so are going and that even though the basic ideas of systems analysis and design we have been talking about are still important you got to be kind of looked at from a slightly different perspective of being able to provide say a web service. Like for instance, if you got web service available to check your decision tables for logical correctness and so on, then you will actually log on to the web service and use that instead of doing your own work, uh, your own checking and so on. So, there will be an assistance which is which will come from the from the web and uh, it will be economical in the long run even if you have to pay for it because these are the points which you have to keep in the back of your mind while working in the industry in terms of new uh, new trends which occur all the time ok. And our field as you know is very dynamic and it is it's never it is not static and you have to continuously unlearn what you have learned and relearn new facts as you go along. So, I am going to now talk about another important topic which uh, is there whether it is going to be a network or whether it is going to be a single computer uh, or whatever it is. This is the importance of control, audit and security of information systems. In fact, the security of information systems becomes lot more difficult and important when you go to a, a network of computers. In network of computers, when computers are connected to every other computer, security issues become a very, very serious issue, uh, mainly because of the fact that uh, people can snoop on the, and there are, you know, people are, the people who are, uh, who can hack onto the machines and uh, get data which does not really belong to them and they, they can trade the data. There has been lots of frauds which are, which are being, being committed all the time. Uh, using using the internet uh, to kind of raid banks and steal account numbers and stuff like that. Similarly, credit card companies are uh, forever uh, alert about uh, somebody breaching their security and getting into their uh, uh, website and steal credit card numbers, passwords and stuff like that. So, I think uh, it is extremely important to worry about uh, not only uh, security, but auditing. In other words, auditing is something breach occurs. See, actually if a breach occurs, somebody has done a fraud, you are able to track down the fraudster. So, you must have an audit trail which is called. In other words, be able to pinpoint who did it, at what time he did it, who often he has done it. So, once you can pin it to a particular person, you can take, you know, you can actually uh, up depending upon the kind of thing he has done, he may even be sent to jail. Okay. If he has done a fraud of financial type, uh, he can go to jail. The New Information Technology Act even says that if you hack into somebody else's uh, website and alter that uh, website, there is do some damage uh, mischievously, not necessarily to steal, even then you are liable to uh, 6 months imprisonment. So, there is a, a serious offence. Okay, and so audit trails are very important, and uh, control is the what what you really require is controlling the uh, make sure that uh, you put in enough of a safeguard in the design of your system in such a way that such frauds are minimized. In other words, even if some frauds occur or some mistakes occur, not necessarily fraud, an error in data entry or error somewhere along the line occurs, uh, that error has been detected early in the life cycle of the, of the system. 
so that the error does not remain there and propagate further. So, control is an important part that is what controls should, should I put to avoid problems, uh, we need methods audit and testing of infrared system whether the infrared system you deliver is uh, it works as per the specifications or not and security as I pointed out. So, the, the what we will learn about these are these. these. See the primarily we we will ask the questions why are controls necessary in information systems and how to control what methods are used to control information systems and how to control that is why it is required and uh, what are the methods available and how to implement those methods. And uh, apart from similar questions we will ask about uh, uh, auditing, say like for, uh, the for instance we talked about control, similarly we talk about audit, why they require auditing, uh, how are systems aud audited, the methods used to test information systems and uh, how to, how, uh, how the security of information systems is ensured. In other words, similarly why how, uh, the, uh, what are the methods available and how to, how, to, how to implement them are all common whether it is control or audit or security. All three topics we had asked the same questions. And um, as I have been pointing out, it is very important to ensure the reliability of reports produced by the information system. If unreliable reports are seen by users, the entire credibility of the system is lost. Okay. This is, as I pointed out, uh, very often exam results, if a mark sheet, if a wrong mark sheet gets to a person, apart from causing uh, unnecessary hardship for the, for the student, it also reflects badly on the way in which the system is designed to give you, give a, a wrong information. So, people completely lose their uh, trust on the information just about the computer. They always start blaming the computer and not the person who designed the system on the computer. Computers do not make any mistakes normally. There is, there is no hardware mistakes which are made by machines. In other words, no additional mistakes are normally made. Uh, whereas, uh, mistakes are in programming, in data entry are made by people. So, you got to guard against people's uh, weaknesses and that is what the whole thing is about. Ensuring uh, reliability is not difficult for small systems. For small systems, you can essentially go through a walk through and two people can look at it and so on. But when it becomes million lines of code, it becomes important to have systematic controls. And so, uh, uh, for large systems, designing the large is quite different from designing the small. Uh, many computer, many uh, computer organizations, companies are entirely dependent on computer based information systems. They have gotten data their manual systems. They are all based on computers because everything is connected, everybody's desk has got a, a laptop or a PC, a desktop computer and there is a whole network. So, because of that the dependence becomes very high. When dependence becomes very high and also there is a lot of sensitive information like financial data, in the case of engineering companies their, their uh, drawings and so on. And, um, any company has got data which is sensitive to them, their sales figures may be and uh, what their plans are in the future, strategic ideas, lots of things which are, um, which are specific for the company and all these things are effectively stored in the machine. So, uh, essentially it is essential to protect the system against frauds, ensure that sound accounting practices are followed, the accountability as well as accounting. But, uh, uh, if it is actually uh, deal with finances, you have, to have sound accounting policies. Necessarily, it is placed the origin in fixed responsibility, as I said, if the, if the fraud occurs. <coughs> Audit is primarily for this. And a system contains many individual subsystems because it is a million line code, one monolithic system cannot really be handled easily. It will be divided into subsystems or modules, different people will design different modules and then they will all be linked together. There is a whole motivation for object oriented modeling which you looked at, okay, where objects are all designed separately and then objects are linked together as though they are components to get the whole system working. 
So, even though subsystem may work, when you link them together to make a full system, it may have some fault. It is like a jigsaw puzzle, you know, you have a lot, lot of things which you have to put together. The whole thing should looks, look correct. And if you do not have the, that ability to put them together properly, then there will be errors in the final system. So, apart from individual subsystem, the, indi the entire system has to be, design, has to be tested. And uh, so when the integration occurs, unforeseen errors may creep up. Okay. So, before releasing the system, the entire operating system should be tested for correctness and completeness. Okay. So, this is uh, very important, but on the other hand, it is very difficult. So, people claim that you know, if, you, if you, every system individually works, you have a higher, higher uh, confidence that the interconnected system will work. But you have to really look at the interfaces. Okay. Is the system giving the right information required by the, by the uh, other subsystem? Is it interpreting it correctly? These are questions which have got to be answered very carefully. In other words, if it is best to insulate each of them, so that error made by some other system does not affect what happens in this system. So, each system should be self-contained. But then, even then, if some message or something comes here, the interpretation of that message, is it correct? That is what is important to kind of look at. Systems contain sensitive data about the organization and also about persons working in the organization. There is a lot of private data about people. Okay. And uh, in a hospital system, for instance, uh, there is a lot of data about patients, medical data. And uh, in any company, there will be a lot of data about the salaries of individuals. And in any bank, there will be a lot of data about the account holders, how much they ho hold, and uh, what is their withdrawal and deposit pattern, and so on. These are all very sensitive, and you've got to be very, very careful about protecting them um, from thieves. Sometimes it is disgruntled employees. Thieves are, of course, fraudsters who kind of take it away and try to sell it. Okay, that seems to be happening in our uh, many of our uh, uh, so-called call centers and so on. Where uh, they are, we are not security conscious. Then the call center employee can really, uh, uh, you know, steal some data and uh, sell it to somebody else. And this has been happening in the last few months. Uh, there have been paper news items and so on, uh, which have. Uh, brought out this and there is credibility of those call centers and so called BPOs that is business process outsourcing organizations depend very much on ensuring privacy and ensuring also uh, security or whatever they are actually uh, assigned to. Okay. So, it is ex extremely important to worry about the, the, uh, the fact that there are employees who kind of as, uh, act as fraudsters, they are outsiders who try to get into your system and steal and let. Lastly, the discriminated employees who are somebody who is unhappy, who is about to leave you and so on and he intentionally kind of corrupts some stuff as a revenge for whatever he thinks uh, has been the wrong committed against him and so on. That is, and these are all, you know, human, human qualities. I mean, all said and done, uh, you know, human beings have their own weaknesses. In a weak moment, he may even sell it. He, otherwise, he may be a very honest person. Okay. So, the point really is the system designer has a responsibility to make sure that uh, the, the, because of human weakness, if something is done, there is detected. And first of all, you prevent it. Prevention is a lot more better than. Uh, auditing and finding out who to and fix responsibilities and so on. That the first step you have to prevent it and if you are not able to prevent it, then only you have to worry about if I do not prevent, how do I fix responsibility? Who, who, who has done the fraud? Okay. So, if you go, so the, well, I want to point out that the most important thing is to make sure with the proper controls that you prevent it to begin with. And uh, so, that is essentially what the controls are all about. 
as so access should be act carefully controlled and provided only to persons on a need to know basis. You should not allow unnecessarily people to get into databases and so on, which for which they have no business to get into. And also sensitive databases where they are stored in disks and so on, they got to be encrypted. Unless they are encrypted or garbled, otherwise, you know, uh, when somebody retrieves it uh, by either design or by mistake, you, you, you can get, get across data which he has no business to get into. And uh, only people who are authorized will be given the decryption key to be able to decrypt it and use it for whatever they were, use they want to make it for, only for people who are doing. Very often the encryption decryption is done with, with fingerprints and fingerprint readers are now widely available and you just put a fingerprint, only if you put, put your fingerprint, the, the database get, gets decrypted. So tomorrow you cannot say the iron date because your, your uh, thumbprint is there and the time at which you logged on is there and all that is there in the machine, okay. And so you have been watched uh, continuously by the system. These kinds of things are the what, what is required to be built in the design to prevent because if, if people know that they are being watched and whatever they do, they, be, they, they will be detected sometime or other, then they will be much more careful. They will not, uh, hopefully, it will prevent them from doing the fraud, okay. Um, so the, the, uh, the fear of going to jail is what keeps a lot of people honest, okay. So the same way, in this case, uh, uh, the fear of being caught is also as important uh, as uh, when, they, when you design the system. So you put a certain amount of, uh, apart from responsibility, which of course people are supposed to have, you also have to put along with it some little bit of uh, controls so that uh, there is also some, uh, you might say, uh, tr uh, audit trail, uh, will trail you, okay. Computer network corruption, erasure may take place due to viruses. Viruses are ever present problem in a network of computers. So uh, you have to uh, uh, make sure that viruses do not do not get in. Uh, there is also something called denial of service attacks. In other words, what they try to do is if you are doing e-commerce or using, using a website, they send a, another computer generates thousands of inquiries so that legitimate users cannot get into your site. So in other words, the fraudster has really denied legitimate service to your, to your other customers by effectively keeping your uh, space engaged. An uh, analogy would be like, you know, somebody, if you want to make your telephone inoperative, what the person can do is to call you and not hang up. Then it becomes more or less uh, the, uh, you, you kind of are uh, held up because you put down and then he can give you continuous, he can be having a machine to continuously call you and keep your, your, your computer engaged so that somebody else wants to legitimately call you, he cannot call you because your computer, com uh, telephone is always engaged because it's fra somebody is fraud, doing a fraud by repeatedly calling your number, okay, and uh, with no message. Is, uh, the call comes from a, a computer, you pick it up and there is no message, just a whistle and then you put it down and immediately another call comes. It can be a nuisance. Same way, it is somewhat like a denial of services, something similar to that. In other words, it, 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 it you, are, you are flooded with a lot of uh, inquiries by legitimate people, okay. System should be designed for appropriate security measures. And there is one more thing which is very important nowadays, that is disaster recovery. Disaster recovery is something which uh, is essential, like for instance last year in India, there is a lot of disasters. There is a, a earthquake in Kashmir, there is an earthquake in Gujarat, there is a flooding of uh, Mumbai. The, uh, the in fact, a lot of uh, computers uh, in, the, in, the, in the suburbs, computer centers all got flooded and computers became inoperative. And uh, of course, everybody talks about the 9-11 as when the World Trade Center was, was destroyed, 
whole lot of computers in that car, in that building belong to many companies, banks, insurance companies and so on, all got destroyed. And so, they had a problem of uh, this is a disaster, because you can't foresee that uh, there will be a flood. Okay. The uh, floods in Bombay were supposedly the uh, biggest floods for uh, over 100 years. Similarly, floods also occurred in Bangalore and uh, many places flooding occurred last year. Okay. So, these are all, and uh, when I say last year, it is uh, the year uh, 2005, there is a lot of uh, disruption during the monsoons. And um, so, the navigation depends entirely on a computer. When such a disaster occurs, they must have a con business continuity plan. In other words, their service should not be disrupted. Okay. And their databases should be protected. Okay. So, there are two situations. One is you must have continuous continuity of service, this is called business uh, process continuity. And also uh, some archiving, so that you can recover your database and so on. So, it is essential to uh, ensure quick recovery from disasters and ensure continuity of service. So, there are many levels depending upon the criticality of your um, operation, you would get to different levels of disaster recovery. You know, if you have a, a airline reservation system and the reservation system is down for two hours, people have lost a lot of customers. And so, one would like to have a system whereby even if there is a failure of a ma major server, then some other server takes over and continues the service for you. So, this is the kind of thing which you make sure a disaster recovery. So, primarily then we see that a requirement for control, requirement for audit, requirement for security and also part of the security disaster recovery is a, is a perhaps you might say is something like uh, some aspect of security. Security one aspect of course, is protecting, the other aspect protecting against intruders and so on, the other is protecting against natural calamities, both are important. So, control are methods to ensure that system process data as per design and that all data is included and are correct. So, very often some data are left out, like when you are data entering data of a lot of students who exam passing results come, if you leave out a few students, the results won't be declared and you got to really worry about what happened, okay. the particular student is badly affected and uh, you have to make sure that all data is included and uh, that all data is correct. Audit and testing ensures that the system is built as per specifications and that process results are correct and uh, protect systems from fraud. Security is con concerned with protection of data resources, programs and equipment from illegal use, theft, vandalism, accidents, disasters, etc. So, we effectively have security, audit and testing and control. These are three aspects which are very important. As I said, information systems handle massive amounts of data. Accidents such as not including some data can cause serious damage. Incorrect data entry leads to sometimes high monetary loss. Suppose uh, somebody enters in a bank uh, uh, data entry is about 1000, uh, 1 lakh as a huge loss. Now, the question is who is going to bear that loss? Credibility is also lost. Suppose you withdrew 1000 rupees and uh, suddenly you find that the lakh of rupees in with somebody has, it shows the lakh of rupees withdrawn and of course, you do not have a lakh in your, your bank, then you immediately say the computer has made a mistake, even though the program is not, not correct or system is not correct. Controls to make sure that data entering the computers are correct. That is what you have to make sure. Check clerical handling of data before it is input to the computer. Any, any mistakes in clerical handling, after all, is a human problem. Okay. Uh, provide means of detecting and tracing errors which occur due to bad data or bad programs. It can be the errors can occur because of bad data input or bad programs. In fact, the common saying is garbage in, garbage out. Your program may be correct 
but if suppose you feel wrong data, you can answer will be wrong. And so, legal requirements are met. Very often, there are legal requirements, which uh, particularly for banking and so on, where there is a requirement for regular audit and in some organization there is a public audit. So, the system should be designed so that it is amenable to uh, such audits and all the legal requirements are met. Of course, to guard against frauds. There are many techniques that are available for control. First of all, there is something called organizational methods. Uh, the, in the organization, you must have well defined responsibility for input preparation, it is a group for input preparation and uh, they are well trained for doing that and um, you have to make sure that up when, the, when this uh, data preparation is done, at the end of the preparation, the correctness of the prepared data is, is uh, checked. Any error is automatically detected. Delivery of that data, output use, how is the output used? Operation and maintenance of the computer. Operation and maintenance of not only the, comp the hardware, but the application software, which is running on the machine, because we are mainly concerned with the application software. If there are any changes in the program, it may be due to some requirement changes, but any changes should be documented because it could be a fraud. Somebody changed a little uh, one one st state in the program to, uh, de to debit rather than credit, okay, and that can play havoc, okay. So, plus put a minus, okay, and uh, so any, any kind of a change has to be documented and it is going to be trailed who made the change, when was it made. Uh, performance of the task and recording must be for different persons to prevent frauds. Banks follow it regularly. In other words, they, 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 you know, in fact, uh, they have double uh, account entry and so on. And um, uh, for instance, the, when the check, check, check is encashed by somebody, somebody else checks the uh, balances at, uh, at the end of the day, particularly for cash cash transactions, okay. And cash at the beginning and the end are uh, responsibilities of two different people, see. It is counted and given and then counted and taken back by a different person, okay, and by not, the, not by the same person. In the, the, the control measures which are, or techniques which are used, are one is called input preparation control, where you have sequence numbering. So, if you miss anything, the sequence numbering will tell you what you have missed. Okay. There are batch controls for the whole batch and data entry and verification. Uh, whenever data is entered, somebody else also enters it and the two are compared and verified. And there are portals for records and self checking. There is a self checking code we talked about uh, in a, an earlier case. In other words, uh, the, the checking of numbers, not so that it is essentially uh, uh, input is correct. So, I will come back to this again next time and look at the input preparation controls in greater detail, okay, because we are running out of time in this uh, today, okay. So, I will see you ne next time.